Well, last week we watched the video about Islam. Uh, it was kind of just an overview. Uh, we, we never said that it was kind of an in-depth thing. I, I doubt we could cover uh, all of the years of history and all of the things that they teach uh, and uh, so on and so forth uh, in a 40 minute video. Uh, but uh, it kind of gave us a basic introduction of, of what uh, Islam is all about. And the reason we threw this one in, it's well, kind of obvious. Uh, you, you know, every, everywhere you turn, it seems like uh, every other day we're talking about you know, Islam this or Islamophobia or, you know, something of that nature. So it's good for us to know on the basic level, you know, what exactly is, um, uh, what exactly is this thing called Islam? Who is Muslim and, you know, the adherence uh, to all of these different religious beliefs? You know, what is it that they believe uh, and why is, uh, you know, <clears throat> why do they do some of the things, uh, you know, that they, that they do? Um, but um, anyhow, is this ringing? Do you hear ringing? Is it just me? Okay, he's got it. Okay. Um, so last week we watched the video, <clears throat> and this week we'll go through a few more things, but uh, I did want to, like we always do, I uh, want to kind of throw it back to you all. Um, you had the notes in front of you, and hopefully you, you copied down some of the things uh, from the video, answered the questions, uh, but, but perhaps that prompted, uh, you know, some further inquiry on your part, uh, and perhaps that prompted further questions. Uh, I will tell you this, I, I in no way, shape, or form uh, w would even get remotely even close to claiming, you know, some kind of grand scholarship on Islam. So um, I I've read, uh, I've done some study, but I, I can't uh, tell you that I can <laughs> answer every question you might have. Maybe some other folks in the audience, though, know a little bit more uh, about it. Uh, but, you know, we are predominantly students of God's Word, uh, and um, you know, we proclaim that. And it's unfortunate, but uh, Islam uh, is um, very much out of harmony with what the Bible teaches uh, in many, many different fronts. But before we get into some of that, uh, let's just kind of throw it open to you all. Well, what, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Kimmy. <clears throat> sure. Right. Yeah, and, and I think uh, that's a good place to start. You know, by looking at the positives, uh, I think that that's you know probably the the biblical example of things. You know, when uh, you know when we have something that might be difficult to to say, uh, we always start with the things that we can find that are positive. Right. Uh, it's just a good model to follow, and, and I think that there are things that are very admirable about those who uh, are of this system of belief. Uh, for and probably the chief among them is their dedication. Uh, you know, when it talks about, you know, prayer uh, being offered uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know what the times of day are, uh, but I do know that in countries that are predominantly, you know, Muslim, uh, and I think it's five times a day? Yeah, five times a day. C countries that are, you know, predominantly Muslim, they, they actually have, uh, you, you know, chimes that sound or bells that go off uh, that remind you that it is the time for prayer. Uh, and uh, people will pretty much stop what they're doing, uh, no matter where they are, uh, face toward, you know, Mecca and offer their, their prayers. Um, that is a very, you know, dedicated thing. It, they don't necessarily care who's looking. Uh, they don't necessarily care where, you know, they are. Um, they simply, you know, bring out their prayer rug uh, and go through their um, various things uh, that uh, they devote in prayer. Here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they're very dedicated. Uh, it seems very, uh, you know, very well taught uh, among their people. I mean, they are. <clears throat> you know, the second largest uh, religion, some people say, and it kind of probably depends on how you look at numbers, uh, say that they're the fastest growing. Uh, well, there's a good reason for that. Um, you know, and they must be doing, you know, something, you know, correct uh, in order to, you know, bring along generations of people. Uh, and, you know, in that you've got to, uh, you know, find, uh, you know, some admiration. Okay, very good. But, 
Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very, very good. <clears throat> Anyone else? Among the disturbing things about Islam, they keep advocating the, the religion of peace, but why aren't the peaceful ones speaking up out against the terrorists? Yeah, there is, and again, I, I'm not even going to pretend to know the numbers. Uh, but most of us are well aware of the fact that, um, you know, there, there's a must be fairly large segment uh, of the population uh, that <clears throat> takes uh, the, the, the teachings uh, of the Quran uh, very, very literally. Uh, many of them, you know, disclaim that, uh, but um, they, they take it very, very literally. And essentially, the Quran basically does command them to kill the infidels. Uh, and to, to take them, you know, to take their system, uh, including that, uh, you've probably heard the term Sharia, which is more of that civil uh, aspect uh, of their law. And that's why a lot of people call it more of an ideology, and that's why I called it an ideology in the video. Uh, this is not just simply a religious or spiritual practice. Uh, it is something that inundates their life down to, <clears throat> they see, uh, the system of law that they, that they follow. Um, so, you know, that's why you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, the desire to implement things like, you know, Sharia, uh, and because that uh, w would be the completeness uh, of their, you know, religious practice, which would include that civil aspect, um, you know, of, you know, Islam's authority, I guess. Uh, so you, you do have a, a large segment. I mean, you know, there, there are many who, uh, I've got it, thank you. <clears throat> I just need to drink it. There are many, <clears throat> many who fall into that, you know, Islamic, you know, terrorist uh, category, and they do that, uh, you know, in the name of, you know, their <clears throat> religion. Uh, and I, I don't think that they would claim to be a religion of peace. Um, they would believe that, you know, the spreading of their law, uh, the spreading of Sharia, the spreading of Islam is more important uh, than any peace that you would have with those who are considered people of the book or infidels outright. Um, that's typically how Islamic folks view the world. You know, you fall in a couple of different categories. Uh, people who are Jewish, people who are Christians would be called, you know, people of the book. Uh, and they would simply have to convert um, or revert, they would say, uh, back to, you know, Islamic uh, belief. Um, those who are non-believers in, you know, Islam or, or Christianity or Judaism uh, are considered infidels, uh, and they are worthy of death, pretty much, uh, is what, uh, you know, the, the teaching says. Um, so that's the way they kind of perceive things. Now, you know, is, is the average Muslim in a mosque in, in St. Pete, 
you know, going to, you know, try to kill you simply because he's your neighbor? You know, probably not. You, you know, but, um, you know, Ken's right. Uh, we, we don't see a mass outpouring of, <clears throat> you know, condemnation of those who are claiming to be uh, Islamic, um, you know, committing these, you know, vile crimes against, well, humanity as a whole. Uh, you, you know, if it were, you know, someone who claimed to be a, a Christian uh, and, you know, walked into to some place and committed, you know, these crimes or flew a plane into something or set a bomb over here uh, and did that, I'm pretty sure that Christian leadership uh, would step up and say, you know, we, we denounce any of that. We are not about that. We are, you know, uh, and even point to examples where, you know, the opposite is true. Uh, and do everything that, you know, was within our power uh, to be helpful in, in that situation and bring uh, those folks to, to justice. But you just don't see that a lot uh, when it comes to these types of acts. Someone had their hand up. Bud, do you have your hand? Go ahead. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, other thoughts? Things that occurred to you about the video? Things you'd like to share? All right. So, so having watched the video and knowing what goes on in our world, what, what are your impressions of, you know, Islam? What, what do they stand for? I mean, we know they pray. Kimmy brought up the fact that they pray. And they're highly devoted to, you know, prayer. We know that they have mosques. Uh, so we know that they engage in, in, you know, worship. We know that they have a book, and that book is called the Koran, right? We know that they have uh, a, a civil law that goes along with that called, you know, Sharia uh, law. And a lot of people take issue, you know, with that, and, and rightfully so. Um, there are things in there, certainly, that would not be in harmony with, you know, Christians uh, and the way that Christians believe. Um, but what else do we know? Uh, about what it means to be Islam. What else do we know? Not much. Well, let's start with let's start with the book, right? I mean, it, with when it comes to Christianity, why do we believe what we believe? Well, you know, we know that we can look in the, the world around us, and we can, from the natural world, observe just kind of logically that certain things are the case. I mean, this stuff didn't get here by itself. You know, I mean, where there's design, there has to be a designer, so on and so forth. We can make those arguments. But when it all boils down to, uh, or what it all boils down to, really, when it comes to Christianity, is we have a book. And this book is the Bible, uh, as we call it. Uh, and um, is there proof for it? Um, you, you know, what uh, kind of evidence do we have for its, you know, validity, uh, its accuracy, its transmission, its preservation, you know, all of that. And we've covered that already in previous lessons. And we know that when it comes to the Bible, we stand upon a rock-solid foundation. So that when it makes statements like faith comes by hearing, we know that this book is the core, the center uh, of what it means uh, to be uh, a, a Christian. Uh, and of course, it is the place that teaches us about God, the specifics. It is the place that teaches us about Christ and his sacrifice and uh, that, um, you know, atonement that, that was made, uh, you know, for us and the forgiveness of our sins and, and so many other things uh, that, you know, we follow uh, as a uh, people, right? And we've examined, you know, all of that and we've encouraged people uh, and would still continue to encourage people 
take a look at the book, you know, examine it. Uh, and many people have, and time and time and time and time and time and time again, uh, throughout the centuries, though people have, you know, tried to destroy it and try to disclaim it and try to undermine it, it stands. Okay? Well, what is the foundation upon which Islam stands? I mean, it's, it's great that they're devoted. It's great that they build mosques and they worship and they have a really good, you know, core as far as maybe family goes. Uh, and they're spreading. They're increasing. Uh, and that's something that, you know, again, those are all things that, that are admirable, you know, things. But what is the foundation upon which they stand? Why do they do the things, you know, that they, you know, do? Uh, and that's going to make all the difference, right? So in order for us to really kind of dig into it, we've, we've got to ask some questions about the Quran. What do you know about the Quran? Because that's where their religion is based, right? Uh, everything that we know about them and their practice comes from uh, the teachings that are in, you know, this book. Okay. All right. So, yeah, if, if you look at how it's explained by folks who are, uh, you know, Muslims, then it's essentially what they're going to tell you. Um, Muhammad's going to receive this revelation from God through the course of the years. It is written down uh, primarily by the people who are, you know, around Muhammad. Uh, and uh, they are collected uh, into this uh, book, uh, having been given by God. Uh, and that is essentially, you know, the book that they, they follow. Uh, the, the, the teachings and instructions, and in that book, it, uh, you know, talks about uh, essentially, you know, the, the right paths, the wrong paths, uh, and uh, the different pillars upon which they uh, supposedly should base their lives. Uh, the core system of, you know, values, uh, and so on. So, yeah, they do see it as coming from Allah or uh, from God. You know, so, all right, that, I mean, that's the basic of someone had, I think I saw Kimmy, and then Christine, and then Bud. Okay. Well, if they did, then Abraham was either a very, 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 very old guy. <laughs> no, basically, the, the, the assertion of, the, uh, of Islam is that uh, the people, um, the, 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 what is it, the Arabian people, the proponents of Islam, um, and I can't remember the exact wording, uh, are descendants of Ishmael. You know, the, the Jewish people would have been, you know, uh, descendants uh, of, you know, Isaac, the son of promise. Uh, but they, these people would have been um, the descendants of Ishmael. Uh, and it's very, very interesting as you get into some of the history. You know, they, they talk about all the, the different stories and all the history. And, and history, is one of <clears throat> history is one of the last things that... Um, the person who believes in Islam will really want to talk about uh, because history does not prove um, the case for Islam at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, there, there are direct contradictions uh, in well-established writings um, to the Islamic faith. And, and I'll give you one that has to do with um, Ishmael himself. When the Quran tells the, the story, um, uh, and it does. It tells the story of Abraham offering his son 
Uh, it doesn't tell the story <clears throat> of Abraham offering Isaac. It says that Abraham initially uh, tried to sacrifice Ishmael. Uh, sacrifice Ishmael. Uh, and it gets a little bit more complex uh, than that. But it tells a, a, a slight variation of that same story. But there's simply no historical validity to it at all. I mean, from the places that it mentions uh, to the people who were part of the story um, and so on and so forth. Uh, having realized that the Bible uh, it has been, <laughs> been well established uh, as factual uh, and, you know, rock solid and true, uh, using it as, uh, you know, the standard, uh, you know, to compare this book that was written after it to it, um, it contradicts it. History does not bear out uh, the case for, you know, the Islamic faith. And that's just kind of a comparison of the Bible and the Quran. Uh, and there are several different places that you can go to, to do that. Um, but <clears throat> also, um, kind of secular history. Uh, and, and I didn't really bring uh, a lot of information about it, but secular history um, is, is very different uh, than... Uh, the way the story is told by those who are, you know, adherents to the, you know, Islam, uh, you know, Muslims, I guess. Um, <clears throat> you know, when they talk about the Kaaba and when they talk about, uh, you know, the Kaaba, if you remember, is that um, cube uh, in which uh, originally there were, you know, a host of pagan gods uh, and people from all over would come and worship these pagan gods there. Well, when, when that story is told, it, it does not reflect the history of some of these other people um, uh, surrounding that part of the land. Uh, you know, if you compare their histories to what Islam says about those things, they, they just don't add up. They, they don't fit together. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a couple of good reasons why that is the case. Uh, but... Um, yeah, they believe they're descendants of uh, Ishmael, or this whole <coughs> lineage, this whole idea or ideology comes through, you know, Ishmael, uh, and that he was the son that was going to be offered, uh, and so on. So that's kind of the connection, and that's the reason why we've inserted it here, in, in this part of our study. <coughs> Let me get Christine Bud, and then I'll get Carrie. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, <clears throat> if you do any reading at all, and then you do any reading of scholarship concerning the Quran, what you realize very quickly is, well, there's a couple of different points, and, and I'll make some of those in just a minute, but just to kind of give a general statement, what you realize very quickly is, is that, you know, if, if God was organizing this thing, then it must have been on his worst day ever. Uh, because it, it is not well organized, it is not historically accurate, and most people don't realize there are seven different copies uh, of the Quran. Now, when I say different, I, I mean different in this sense. If we were telling the story of a Adolf Hitler and the, the Nazis and you know, concentration camps and the Holocaust, in, in one version's story, he would be the bad guy, killed millions of people, and, and set up these camps, and it was a horrible, brutal thing. In another story, he would be the good guy who got up and made his kids breakfast every morning, went out to a job and led the people to great power and prosperity and always did good by all men. And then version three would be something, you know, different. Uh, and there was a concerted effort <clears throat> by the proponents uh, way back when this whole thing, you know, started to eliminate uh, all of the, the copies and the records that were different. Uh, and kind of boil it down, and when I say boil it down, I very literally mean boil, because um, apparently that's what they did. 
uh, got a big pot of boiling oil and anything that was different than, you know, one particular chosen version, they tried to get rid of it that way. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just not a very well organized. It's not a very, you know, throughout history, that is. Uh, you know, now I'm sure by today, everything's kind of been solidified into, you know, kind of one sort of, um, you know, finalized document and documentation upon which to, to stand. Uh, and though there are different interpretations, <clears throat> I'm assuming, uh, assuming the fundamental, uh, you know, basis for belief is probably essentially the same. Um, but it's not that way through history. This is not something that came from God uh, and was organized by God uh, and then simply accepted by man. This was something that was organized by man in chaotic fashion uh, and slowly was forced into some mold that is supposed to be God's. Uh, you know, we started here and we realized, oh, well, you know, if we say this here, we, you know, we, and we have to slowly force it into that mold. It, it's hard to duplicate the perfection uh, with which God produced, you know, the Bible. Uh, and the Quran, quite frankly, does a very poor job of it. You know, just general statements. Bud, Kerry, and then Jose. Right. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. As a matter of fact, there's probably nothing in the Quran that is actually original. Nothing. Uh, abso almost absolutely nothing uh, that is original. Right. Yeah, they, they have some pretty funny views about, you know, Christ, and uh, it's odd. And they're inconsistent and contradictory most of the time. Uh, Carrie and then Jose. Well, yeah, and, and yeah, I Ishmael was the, the son of Hagar, right? Who was, you, you, you know, this, yeah, okay. Uh, Ishmael was, was not <clears throat> the son of promise, uh, but you remember that uh, Ishmael is given a promise, uh, that, that he is given the promise, and that promise includes, you know, uh, that he, he is going to prosper and he is going to do, you know, so I mean, if you're going to pick a guy uh, to kind of, you know, model something after, you know, pick the guy who's going to prosper, right? He, you know, I mean, that's what the Bible says about him, uh, that he is uh, blessed by God. Uh, he does receive this, you know, this blessing and this uh, promise, uh, you know, from, uh, from him. So, you know, Ken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely splintered. Right, exactly. Uh, you, you know, they are very fragmented people, and there are, you know, different, 
ways to believe, you, you know. So, I mean, um, and that's just another part of the just kind of scatterbrained uh, nature uh, of the basic writings and tenets itself. Okay. Jose. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Sure. Certainly there's precedent for, for thinking that. I mean, you, we understand the providence of God brings us to, you know, certain times. I mean, we have, you know, we have the history. I mean, it's there. Uh, and uh, I believe our perspective should be 
uh, that, you know, that God in his infinite wisdom um, has given us, not, not only what we need as far as, the, you know, teaching, um, you know, goes and, and a firm foundation to, to stand upon, uh, but that, you know, when there are people who do go against his will, uh, that often those consequences are borne out in front of us so that we may learn, um, you, you know, those paths. But I, mean, I guess that's a, that's a little bigger discussion, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't see why that wouldn't be the case. I mean, you know, we see long-standing consequences of things like that in, in other ways as well. Um, so, yeah, you yeah. know. But anyhow, I, I, I do have a couple of things that I just want to mention. Um, and uh, actually what I want to do, uh, instead of moving on to the next video next week, um, partly because, well, Ed went to camp and I'm just not ready for the next quarter yet. Uh, so I'll admit that to you. But uh, this, the other thing is, is I, I began thinking about, you know, some of this. And, and I want to cover a little bit more uh, of um, the information about Islam. But I also want to make another tie-in. Uh, to, you know, another group uh, that, that is just eerily and oddly similar uh, to, you know, Islam. Uh, and that would be, sometimes we call them Mormons. Uh, sometimes we call them Latter-day Saints. Uh, but there's just a whole lot of similarity between those. Uh, and, uh, of course, there are also people who are going to, you know, kind of take their origins and, and all the way back to the time of Abraham. Uh, so I thought it would be a good time for us to kind of lump them in here, too, uh, and just have a very brief description uh, of, about them. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. There, there's a lot of, you know, kind of mysterious things uh, about them. But uh, So next week, we'll, we'll continue a little bit about Islam, but then I also want to kind of transition and talk just a little bit uh, and introduce us to uh, Mormons, Mormonism, um, again, because there's a lot of similarity uh, between the stories uh, as they're told uh, their origins, their development, uh, and actually their growth uh, as well. Uh, they, are, they, I don't know so much today, but you know, if you just not, not too long ago, uh, they were one of the fastest growing uh, you know, religious groups, uh, at least in our country. So uh, they share a lot of those things. But we'll pick up there next time, so we won't be watching the video. Uh, we'll be coming in here for discussion, and I'll be sharing some of that information with you. I will, however, have the notes for the next quarter, uh, the, 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 the guidebooks um, for next quarter, uh, finished by then and ready to pick up. So that's what we'll go next week. Appreciate everybody's comments and attention. <clears throat> if you would, you can turn it over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, the basis of our lesson this morning is uh, verses, one, or, or verses 1 through 4. In just a minute, we're going to read those verses. Today is Father's Day, uh, as we've already said, and certainly once again, we wish our, our fathers a happy Father's Day, and hopefully, um, the children, uh, you, you will make uh, their Father's Day a happy Father's Day. Father's Day is an interesting holiday. It's, a, it's an interesting day for a number of different reasons, uh, many of which we, we simply don't have the time to talk about, most of which you can find from just simply observing fathers, much of which we can find within Scripture and about what it says about fathers and the role of fathers and the role that they play in our lives and the things that they do for us. But it is an interesting day because of the nature of what it means to be a father. Fathers are mentors. Fathers are friends at times. Fathers are teachers, and fathers are elders, and fathers are so many things and wear so many hats. And there's so many different ways we could approach the idea of fatherhood. But I want us this morning just to simply look at some of the concepts that we find within the Bible. Look at some of the things that we've experienced in our life. And for the next few moments... Just simply appreciate what fathers have done and continue to do for us. As is described within Scripture. Of course, ultimately, when we talk about fatherhood, we're talking about our Heavenly Father. 
We're talking about what he does for us, and I believe that fathers is one of fathers are one of those things that God provides for us, so that we, throughout the course of our life, can be led closer to our heavenly Father. And if our fathers are doing their job correctly, if our fathers are doing their job as God has given it to them, then I think ultimately that will be the case. Will there be heartache? Yes. Will there be pain? Yes. Will there be those who simply don't listen? Yeah. Will there be errors? Will there be mistakes? Will we have to seek forgiveness? Will we have sorrow? Yes. All of those things kind of go along with the nature of not simply being human, but with having a father. It was interesting. Uh, while I was at camp, Carrie was sending me messages, and we would message back and, and forth each and every day. And one of the things that she sent me was this, uh, this video. Uh, and it was um, a, a video of Jimmy Fallon. Uh, Jimmy Fallon. He has this, uh, uh, has this thing that he does. Uh, and one of, uh, just uh, like a, kind of a hashtag, you know, Twitter type thing. And I don't get into all of that stuff. But it was a list of basically bad advice received from fathers. Uh, and it was just the funniest thing. There were a couple of them that, that, that I remember. One, one of them was, you know, if you're ever being beat up by a bully son, just laugh in his face because he'll think you're insane and leave you alone. I, I wonder if that, that worked. Uh, I, I highly doubt it. But my favorite one was this one. If you're ever at the beach and you're swimming and you sh see the shark fin appear, swim as fast as you can toward the shark to establish dominance. Yeah, I, I don't advise that one. And that's certainly not good fatherly advice. Another one that I, that I read and I remember reading a while ago was this. Father uh, offered a son of advice. Son, don't spend too much time learning the English language. You already know how to speak it. You know, not exactly the best I I advice given. But fathers typically fill that role of giving advice and being there when we need them. And yet, sometimes we don't exactly appreciate fathers for who they are and what they do, and how much time they, they spend actually with us, molding and, and shaping us. Though they make mistakes, and though there's sometimes not always the best of things there, they do with us, hopefully, what God desires to do with all of humanity. It's Mark Twain who once wrote this, When I was a boy, my father... When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stab, stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> the popular comedian Bill Cosby tells the, the story this way. He says, now that my father is a grandfather, he just can't wait to give money to the kids. But when I was a kid and I asked him for 50 cents, he would go on and on and on, telling me his whole life story, at the end of which I never got any money. He says, so nowadays when he, he shows up at my house, the first thing he says when he comes in the door is, let's see how much I have here for my grandkids. And he gives the money to my kids. And then as soon as the kids get the money, I call him over and I ask him, how much did grandpa give you? And when they hold out their hand, I snatch it from their hands and I say, it's mine. <laughs> Interesting. Someone once wrote these words as a list of things that fathers have said, advice that they had given. This is going to hurt you more than it, or hurt, hurt me more than it hurts you. Quiet, I'm watching the ball game. Don't forget to check the oil. Bring back all the change. How should I know? Ask your mother. I'm not made out of money. When I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each day, and it was uphill both ways. You are going, and you will have fun. Who's paying the bills around here anyway? If you break your leg, don't come running to me. <laughs> That's a funny one. <laughs> don't put your feet on the furniture. Your mother will kill you. Get down before you kill yourself. On second thought, go ahead. Quit playing with your food. Be quiet. Can't you see I'm trying to think? Why? Because I said so. If you don't quit, I'm going to tell your mom. You better get that junk picked up before your mother comes in here. Just wait till you have kids of your own. I was not asleep. I was just resting my eyes. Some of the things that one author has written about things that father says. 
And no doubt we could add to the list as well. My favorite one is very simply this, how could you not know? That was offered by one of Carrie's relatives, but I've found myself saying it over and over. How could you not know? And no doubt many, many others. Being a parent and a father is indeed an interesting experience. And that's why we say that being, you know, fatherhood in and of itself is, is an interesting time. Someone once put it this way. They said, parents spend the first part of their lives, uh, excuse me, parents spend the first part of their child's life urging them to talk and to walk and the rest of their childhood telling them to sit down and to be quiet. Another father once said to his daughter, what's wrong, Judy? Usually when you're on the phone, you talk to your friends for a couple of hours. And Judy's response very simply was this. It was the wrong number. She talked for 30 minutes. A letter from a college student to his dad said, please send food packages. All they serve here is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Another college student wrote to his parents and said, dad, I'd love to hear from you more, preferably in fives and tens. fatherhood. But in all seriousness, there are things that God tells us should define what it means to be a father. No matter what we think of our fathers and no matter what kind of advice, whether it's that swim toward the shark advice or whether it's that good advice, like always put God first. There are things that God says about fatherhoods that we do well to fatherhood that we do well to remember because we have many fathers many great and godly men who do their best to uphold this standard i want us just to read or begin by reading what we find paul saying in the book of ephesians chapter one chapter six verses one through four he says children obey your parents in the lord for this is right Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you, and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. There are things that define fatherhood, and I think it's those things that we must key in on, and today, of all days, Give thanks for those things, for they've come from our heavenly father to our earthly fathers, and they have given them to us in grand fashion. Number one, I think that we need to be thankful for material possessions. If you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, you'll read a verse there that says something kind of like this. The man who does not provide for his own family is worse than an infidel. Is worse than the unbeliever. And you know, typically, as we look back on our society, as we look back on even other societies, we realize that it's the Father upon whose weight that burden is placed to bring home the bacon, so to speak, to provide for his family. And that's the right thing. That's the way that God has set it up. So much so that to not provide those things, to not go out and make sure that your family has clothes to wear and a house to live in and, 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 and you know, food to eat, Provide those necessities of life. That is like being a non-believer. Failure to provide for family is a failure. A failure to believe in the Heavenly Father. Uh, if that's not really sinking in, and that doesn't seem like a profound statement, then let's dwell on it a little bit more. Failure to provide for family is like you not believing in God. That's an amazing statement. That's how important this is. You know, I know sometimes we talk about, well, you know, material things and da, 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 and, and we ought not overemphasize those things. I mean, after all, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil, right? And people can overemphasize that thing, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about providing the necessities of life. You know, I know plenty of people, and I've heard plenty of stories, even from my own family, about lean, lean times. My grandfather used to talk about how they would eat large sandwiches. They would eat large sandwiches. And, and you know, every once in a while, even up to close to the time he died, he, he, he would make one of those. 
And, and I would always ask him, you know, why? I mean, Pap, you, you, you could get the meat out of the fridge and you could get the cheese and you, you could get anything from any of these cupboards that are well stocked. Or my grandparents, they, man, they canned too. You could go down to the basement and you could get some of those canned goods and you could literally have a gourmet feast every day for like five months on the food that they had stored up at their house. Why would you eat the lard sandwich? And his answer was typically something like this. To remind me of just how much I have. To remind me of those days when my father provided for me, though we had little, but we had love. And I always thought of that as a profound thing. Fathers provide. Why are you like the unbeliever if you don't? Well, because even the unbeliever provides. It's the most basic compulsion of life. To take care of your own is something that comes naturally, or it should. As a matter of fact, there, there's a word in the Greek language that, that defines that very thing. Love of natural affection. It's the word storge. Now, it only appears in the, in the Bible in the, in the negative sense, but there is a natural affection. As part of that natural affection, as fathers especially, there ought to be that drive to want to provide for our families. Many people I've met have said things like, we didn't have much, but we always had something. And you talk to some of the older folks who have gone through some of those very, very lean times in our country, and you'll many times hear those same words. And they'll lay at the feet of their fathers such great accolades because... They provided even when times were lean. Even when it meant they had to work two and three jobs. And there are times like that. Even when it meant that they had to do jobs that was, were well below their capabilities. They provided. They did what was necessary to take care of their wives and their children. Number two. We need to be thankful for faithful instruction. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, you'll notice there again, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Now, this verse is very, very interesting from a number of different standpoints, but I want to read it to you in a couple of different versions. One version says this, Parents, don't be hard on your children. Raise them properly. Teach them and instruct them about God. Another verse that says, don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves of. And finally, another version that says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And I want us to notice just a couple of things uh, about this. Number one, fathers have this responsibility of raising their children. But you see, God realizes that it's not just about raising children and instructing them and teaching them. That there's a right way to do that. And there's a wrong way to do that. There's a fellow I once knew who told me a story about he and his son and something that had happened. You see, every day he would take his son to baseball practice. And he himself, having played baseball, would would sit and he would watch his son and he knew what to look for and he knew what a swing looked like and how to throw and, and to catch and, and, and where to be and how to make plays and all of that. And every time that practice was over, when they would get in the car, they would begin the drive home about 15 to 20 minutes from the field. The father would begin giving instruction to the son. Well, you know, this is what you need to do here and this is what you need to do here and, you know, this is what you did and, da -da -da -da, and he told him. All of these things. And he said one day, near the end of the season, after a long practice, they got in the car and the father began to tell him this thing and the son just very simply looked at him and in frustration very simply said, Dad, stop telling me all of the things I do wrong. At least tell me some of the things that I do right. 
And this guy admitted to me, he says, I've been more of a critic than a coach. And I think that's what Paul's trying to tell us. See, when it comes to kids, it's not just a matter of teaching them. The first thing that we have to teach them is how much we love them. And if they know that we love them, then they're going to receive that instruction. It reminds me of Proverbs 22, 6. It's a passage that sometimes we beat ourselves up with, but it says, train up a child in the way he should go, right? And then later it says, it talks about how when he's old, he will not depart from it. Literally what the verse says is this, train up a child according to the tenor of his way. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And what that means is this, teach a child in the manner with which that child learns. In other words, connect to the child first. What better way to connect than the language of God's love? Connect to that child first, and when you connect with them, the lesson will be that much more powerful. So it's not just about criticizing. It's not just about giving instruction constantly and overly. It's about how we say, and the love that is felt in the words that we so often say. So fathers, they, they provide for us. But they also provide for us not just in a physical way, not just in a monetary way. They provide instruction. And faithful fathers will teach their children. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy and we learn that very well. Fathers are told. Parents are told. You know, wherever you go, when you're leaving your house, teach them then. When you're walking in the street, teach them then. If you're out on the beach, teach them then. If you're in the woods, teach them then. If you're driving in the car, teach them then. And I think what God had in mind when he gave his people that teaching in the long ago was very simply this. That your life should be so full of God and his teaching and his instruction and his example that in everything you do, your children should see God should see through you and to the Heavenly Father. I would think one of the deepest praises that a father could ever receive is their child one day looking at them and saying, Dad, I see Jesus in you. I see God in you. Or to at the end of their life, have a child stand and remember them as being the one that taught them the Bible, who led them in the path of Scripture, who showed them the way of righteousness and taught them what it meant that the Word was a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. So that when they reach that same place, they will know for sure when they meet the Father, that their destination will be a reunion not just with the Heavenly Father, but with their earthly Father. Final thing that we want to mention is thanks for godly illustration. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to notice verse 1. First Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul writes this. He says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Another version puts it this way. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, you'll notice here what Paul doesn't say. And, and I've heard people say that Paul says this, but he, but he actually doesn't. Paul doesn't say, do all that I do. What Paul does say is, do all that I do that Christ has done. Do all that I do that is Christ-like. In other words, my example is worthy of following only as much as it accords with the teaching of Scripture or with the life and the words of Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the big roles of fathers. Fathers provide for us physically, and yes, they teach us about spiritual things, but the greatest thing I think that fathers can do 
is give that illustration of what it means to be a child of God every day. The father that sets the right example in language and action and attitude and all of those characteristics that we find within Scripture that define the child of God will do more to impact their child than any other thing that they could do. I think it was G.K. Chesterton that once wrote this. He said, great words, great and swelling words of advice you may give, but the child will learn by the way you live. And how true it is. You can take them to church on Sunday and put them in exposure to the greatest of Bible lessons, sitting at the feet of the greatest of Bible teachers, and you can even set them on your lap and read the scripture with them and explain it in great detail as if you yourself were a grand scholar, only to undermine it in totality by living a life that is contrary to it. Fathers must live out that godly Example. There's a man who tells this story of his father. He says, When I was a teenager, dad would come to my room once a month and he'd say, Come on, kid, let's go. Where are we going, dad? And he would simply say, We're going to Lucy's. And this man goes on to tell the story that once a month, he and his dad would go to this woman's house. Her name was Lucy Buchko. Lucy was an invalid. She couldn't walk. She couldn't get around. And her father would knock on the door and enter the house, and there was Lucy in her wheelchair, racked with arthritis, in pain and suffering. And the man shared how his father would go over and, with loving hands, pick her up and lift her from the wheelchair and carry her out to their car, place her in the car, and then drive her once a month to Sunday services. He said throughout his entire life, when he was really small, when he was a teen, when he went to college, moved out of the house every month. Dad would go and he would take care of Lucy or another person like them. And one day, this same young man got the call that his father was in the hospital. And while they were visiting with the father, the father had learned that one of their neighbors had had a massive heart attack and was found in his home, rushed to the hospital. But the widow had no way to pay for the hospital bill after the husband had died. So he himself in the hospital tells his son to write a check and to carry it to that woman and to help meet her needs. So the son goes and gets the checkbook. He brings it to the father and with a shaky hand. He writes the check for the amount that he wanted to. He carries it over to this neighbor's wife. And by the time he had delivered that check, his father had passed away, and he shared these words. He says it was the last thing he ever wrote. It was the last thing that he ever did. But it was the thing I remember most about my dad. His giving heart. His giving spirit. From beginning to end. One man once says this, Once when I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for a circus. Finally, there was just one family between us and the ticket counter. This family made, made a, a big impression on this young man. He said there were probably eight children, all of them under 12 years old. And you could tell by looking at their clothes and their shoes and just all of them, that they didn't have much money. The children were well behaved and they stood holding hands and two by two behind their parents who lovingly held one another's hand and smiled at one another as they approached the booth to pay. And when it was finally their turn, this young man tells the story, the father 
leaned forward and said, we need eight children's tickets and two adult tickets. And the woman in the booth quoted in the price, and you could instantly see the man's face fall. And he let go of his wife's hand, and he leaned forward with both hands on the counter and asked yet again, how much did you say? And the woman said it again and slowly became to the realization that they were not going to have enough money to pay, as my father made the realization that they were not going to have enough money to pay. And then again, this young man says, my father next did something I'll never forget. He reached into his own pocket and pulled out $20 bills and $20 bill and dropped it on the ground. Bent over and picked that same $20 bill up and then walked to the gentleman at the front of the line and said, here, sir, I think you dropped this. And the man, knowing what his father had done, took his hand, shook it as hard as he could, embraced him, thanked him, and then turned to pay for his family. Once he had paid for his family, he came back up to his father and he said, I can't thank you enough. It means so much to my family. And we've saved so long for this. And then they walked away and went into the show. And then the young man says this. We went home that night. We bought no tickets. We went to no show. But our hearts were not empty. And I learned one of the greatest lessons I ever could about my father. To be my father is to be a child of God. To walk in my father's steps or to walk in the steps of God. My father, he says, and I quote, went back to the car and we drove home, but we didn't go to the circus, but we didn't go without. Fathers provide. They provide great teaching, but they provide godly example. Do fathers fail? Sure they do. Fathers are not supermen. They're not perfect. All men sin and fall short of the glory of God, and we all have our struggles, and we all have our problems, and fathers, even though they're supposed to have that rough, tough exterior and, and, and excel, and sometimes pride does get in the way of that, and we don't want to admit those faults, they're there. But we can provide. Fathers can give instruction, and they can be that godly illustration. Probably my favorite poem about fatherhood is the one I'm about to read you. I don't know who wrote it. As far as I know, it's anonymous. But every time I think about fatherhood, this is the, th the thing that I think of. It's called A Letter to Dad. There are so many things I'd like to tell you face to face. I either lack the words or fail to find the time and place. But in this special letter, Dad, you'll find, at least in part, the feelings that the passing years have left within my heart. The memories of childhood days and all that you have done to make our home a happy place and growing up such fun. I still recall the walks we took, the games we often played, those confidential chats we had while resting in the shade. This letter comes to thank you and for needed words of praise, the counsel and the guidance, too, that shaped my grown-up days. No words of mine can tell you, Dad, the things I really feel, but you must know my love for you and is lasting, warm, and real. You made my world a better place, and through the coming years, I'll keep these memories of you as cherished souvenirs. Dads, know this. You have a great responsibility. And I think we've outlined at least part of that today. But with that responsibility comes great joy. With that responsibility comes a great amount of wonder, a great amount of impact, a great amount of ability to show forth the wonder 
and the glory of the Father that we've allowed into our hearts and we've allowed to lead our lives. It is our honest and hopeful plea this morning that as we honor our fathers, that we will know and that we will understand that these are men who do their best to honor their father. Well, maybe that's not us. It can't be. Maybe we could do better. We should. Maybe. Maybe. We just simply need to honor our Heavenly Father's desires and bring ourselves in line with His will. This morning, we gather to honor God, to honor our fathers. And the greatest honor that we can give, and the thing that God asks most of us, is our lives. See, one kid once said this. He said, Father's Day is just kind of like Mother's Day, only the gift is a lot smaller. And a lot of fathers would simply respond to that by saying, gift? What gift? <laughs> it's funny. My kids gave me a gift this morning, and of course I told them a couple of things. The first one I told them was, the best gift you can give me today is putting on deodorant. You know, I'm just, I'm just being honest, that's what I told him. Right? <laughs> but the second thing I told him was, the best gift I could have today is just simply spending time with you. But I think that's what God wants from us as well. And I think that's what's going to make us good fathers. Spending time with our Heavenly Father would teach us that we need to provide, and we need to teach, and that we need to set the right example. If you're here this morning... And you've seen that teaching of, of good and faithful men. And we have plenty of examples here to follow. Shoes that I constantly look at and desire to, to walk in. If you've seen those lives and wonder, how could I be like that? Know that it begins by fostering that relationship with your Heavenly Father. Hear His word today. Let it produce in you that faith that leads you to things like repentance and confession of Christ and baptism, which washes away our sins and by such adds, God adds us to the church. If you're here this morning, you need to respond to that invitation to become one of his children. Now's the time. Don't delay. If you're here this morning, you simply need to come back and walk in faithful paths once more. Or if you have some other need, you just simply desire to make known. We urge you to do so as together we stand and sing.